This talk reflects the allure of calculating scattering amplitudes without using Feynman graphs. This is an activity that has been spurred on uh, by methods in string theory, by geometrical structures, and uh, also by the discovery in recent years that often gauge theories are string theories. I will discuss uh, tree amplitudes, uh, the scattering equations, and various proofs and <coughs> polynomial forms. This work is done in collaboration with Peter Goddard, who is here at the Institute and is based on these three papers. <coughs> Following the work of Freddie Kajazal, Song He, and Ellis Wan, uh, that Freddie will speak about tomorrow. And also on earlier work uh, on twister strings by Edward Witten and Nathan Berkowitz. So the talk will discuss a description of amplitudes in any space-time dimensions in terms of scattering equations as conjectured by Kajaz al -He and Song. Sorry, by Kajaz al -He and Wang. Uh, the Mobius invariance of this description and also uh, new massive scattering equations. I will outline our proof of their equivalence with uh, the field theories of phi cube theory and Yang-Mills, uh, and this is in any space-time dimensions. If we now restrict to four dimensions, which, uh, and use the link variables that were originally introduced for field theory by Arkani Hamid and Kajazal, Chung, and Kaplan, uh, we can use those link variables in the twister string, which is a four-dimensional space-time object, and show how the twister string of Witten and Berkowitz implies the scattering equations, and conversely, that the scattering equations imply twister string equations. I'll then sketch our earlier proof for the complete equivalence between the twister string amplitudes and the Yang-Mills theory at tree level. And finally, to end, uh, I will show you a new polynomial form of the scattering equations that will facilitate the computation of their solutions. So Kajazal, He, and Wan made a proposal and gave evidence that this multidimensional contour integral is equal, uh, in fact, to a field theory amplitude of either phi cubed theory or Yang-Mills theory, and they also had a proposal for gravity, depending on the form of this function psi n. Uh, here the contour encircles the zeros of the functions f in the denominator, but not the poles given by this factor. And these functions uh, these n functions are given by this sum, and setting them equal to zero defines a set of equations called the scattering equations. The solutions of these scattering equations, that is to find the z a, so the points are a from 1 to n if you're thinking of an n-point amplitude, the solutions calculate z a in terms of the momenta, and you use those positions of those poles z a to evaluate this contour integral, and and you use the global, global residue theorem to, to actually get an answer for the expression. So it turns out that uh, these equations uh, apparently first appeared in the literature in 1972 uh, and have subsequently appeared uh, in various contexts by Gross and Mende, by Witten, uh, and various others. So our work gives a proof that the A's derived here uh, are, in fact, those of phi cubed theory and Yang-Mills theory. So what is responsible for the fact that this tree amplitude is computing graphs of field theory without using Wick diagrams or Feynman graphs is, must trace back to the Mo Mobius invariance of this integrand. So here's the Mobius transformation, psi n, if it's 1 for the phi cubed theory, it's related to a Fafian for Yang-Mills theory. Those are modular invariant. This d omega is the modular invariant measure on the Mobius group. 
dZA over one factor of this denominator is modular invariant. So this primed product, uh, which is really 1 over f with three of the positions taken away and then replaced by these numerator, transforms under the Mobius transformations in this way, and that cancels against the transformation of the remaining factor here. So this is a Mobius invariant uh, integrand. The integrand is Mobius invariant. The scattering equations are Mobius invariant because the f's transform in this way. Now, we can understand this, uh, use, this use, use our understanding of this Mobius invariance to actually give a more general set of scattering equations. So if we define a function u, uh, and if we take the derivative of u, we see that f hat appears, where f hat is given by this generalized form. Uh, since u is invariant, f will transform like the Jacobian of the transformation. And uh, what, what we can say is that, that the equations f hat equal to 0 are then Mobius invariant. And if we look at infinitesimal transformations of the Mobius group, so that is the translation, the scale transformation, and the global, uh, the, the special conformal transformation, there'll be three of these. Uh, if you, since u is invariant, this variation has to vanish, summed over a. So from these three distinct transformations, we get three relations that the f hat have to satisfy, reducing the number of equations from n, a is running from 1 to n, down to n minus 3. If we further fix uh, three of the points using the Mobius invariance, then we have n minus 3 equations and n minus 3 variables and generally n minus 3 factorial solutions of the ZA in terms of the momentum. Clearly when m squared is 0, we get back to the original set. Now just to be totally clear about the conjecture, this is a field theory amplitude, but say for Yang-Mills, the four-point function at tree level, uh, expressed in a sort of a BCJ type form, and we can replace these group theory factors with traces over the group matrices, and then these are the ordered field theory amplitudes. The n's are given uh, as functions of the momenta and the polarizations, and so one of these ordered amplitudes is given by this formula, and the conjecture of Kajazal, He, and Wan is that this field theory amplitude, or at least the, at the level of these partial amplitudes, will be reproduced by the contour integral computed from evaluating the scattering equation for the position of their poles. Mm -hmm. If we just want to consider a single scalar field, which will be useful in understanding how we went about our proof, even for the Yang-Mills case, uh, we can set psi n equal to 1, and then the four-point function would look like uh, with, with no dressing on it, and the total amplitude is given by a sum over the permutations. So the way that proof of the formula goes is that we shift the momenta. So this is just for an ordinary field theory amplitude to start with. We'll shift the momenta. Uh, two of them, k2 and kn, let's say, by a vector L, satisfying these conditions, and that <coughs> this, this ordered field theory amplitude will have simple poles in zeta because of the uh, propagators and the tree, di tree diagrams that comprise it, and as zeta goes to infinity, the amplitude will vanish so that we can rewrite that amplitude as a sum over those poles with the numerators being given by the residues. So the poles occurring at the standard place where the square of the sum of the momenta uh, of the external particles uh, are, are given by these combinations psi left and psi right. And then the residues, for example, on psi right will be equivalent to a product of amplitudes where the number of particles in these subamplitudes is less. So from that calculation, you can see that if you set zeta equal to zero, that then 
<coughs> that gives you, gets you back to the original amplitude that you're looking for, and the uh, expression in terms of the residues actually gives you any, a result for what the amplitude should be equal to in terms of the residues over the poles. That is the BCFW relation that you all are used to. <coughs> now, our proof is to show that these contour integral amplitudes are, in fact, satisfying the same equation. And the way we go about that is we first look at the expression after we fixed all the Mobius invariants. And we understand that now the integration is going around a contour with the zeros of Fs. And those Fs, since they involve the momenta, they will have be shifted in terms of the zeta. So a pole uh, at, at uh, these sums of uh, momenta that I showed on the previous slide will come from an integration region where the Zas go to zero for this range of the particles. So we can affect that by setting those Zas equal to Xa times something that vanishes. And we can also then divide the points uh, in the measure up into these Xs and a bunch of Zas, and we can show that the integrand will factor into a function of the Zas in this range and the Zxs in this range. And so in the end, in fact, the residue of this curly A is given by a product of the curly A's at lower points, thus proving the formula uh, that this scalar phi cubed theory uh, scattering equation representation is in fact satisfying the BCFW formula and therefore equal to the field theory amplitudes. So moving on to the pure gauge theory, the only difference here really is this function psi n, which is no longer one. It will now include the polarizations of the momenta, among other things, and it uh, is given uh, by the prescription of uh, Kajaz al he and Wan that it's a Fafian of a matrix where the, the second and the nth row have been removed. It's a two n dimensional matrix. And psi also has this extra factor of the z's in it. Now, the, the reason that the Fafian sort of occurs here is that the, the Fafian, of course, being the square root of the determinant of an anti-symmetric matrix, the point is that it can be expressed as a rational function of the entries of that matrix. So uh, you carry out this shift now on the momenta that appears here and also in the Fafian. Uh, and you also have to shift the polarizations as well as the momenta in order to keep the inner products unchanged. And so investigating where the poles in zeta occur for this gauge theory amplitude really is an exercise in understanding the singularity is psi naught. It turns out that all of those singularities are canceled in the numerator and that uh, so the entire pole structure is coming from the scalar case. And the psi ends then factorize at the poles in the integr at the at the poles zeta left and right in the poles of that integrand since the uh, the Fafian just factors there. Um, so here is the the Fafian given for the original amplitude, and you can remember it's just the square root of a determinant of a big thing. So if you work hard enough, you can show it's equal to a sum over product of two sub Fafians. Furthermore, remember there was this one other factor here to get uh, back to the entire answer, and that also will factor. So what we have shown then is that the scattering equation prescription satisfies the BCFW recur recurrence relation, and therefore, again, these equations, these amplitudes are uh, that are computed from the scattering equations are equal to the yang mills field theory tree amplitudes. So I wanted to take a brief foray into twister string theory. This is an alternative derivation of the gauge theory amplitudes without using Feynman graphs. Uh, it starts with a uh, set of twisters and their conjugates. 
twister world sheet variables. These, these Penrose spinners that Matthias talked about in last talk. Uh, these are the vertex operators for positive and negative felicity gluons. <clears throat> of course, now we're restricted to four dimensions, whereas the original work of the scattering equations is true for any space-time dimension. Uh, the tree amplitudes can be written as a product of these vertex operators. And in particular, I wanted to focus on this delta function from the, pot, from the negative felicity operators. So the world sheet variable is a polynomial in order n minus 1. That's the curve that Ed Witten wrote down in twister space, conjecturing that all of the uh, amplitudes with n negative felicities in them would be supported on such a curve and expressed here in terms of the formulation of, of uh, Nathan Berkowitz. <laughs> And uh, uh, these, these equations, these amplitudes, early, early work was done on them by Spradlin and Volovich for certain classes of the amplitudes. Um, the positive felicity vertices uh, are given, this was the negative felicity vertices, the positive felicity vertices are given by this exponential form. And because the, um, delta function restricts this polynomial at certain points to have certain values, then you can write a Lagrange interpolating form for that polynomial uh, in terms of those points Zs. So if we now want to re-express how this <coughs> vertex operator looks in terms of the Zs, it's equal to Zs times some other junk, which we call Cjs. Now Cjs are just the link variables that were originally introduced in field theory, but we've now used them in the twister string. So transforming back to momentum space, we find that the amplitude can be written as a function of the CJR, the link variables, and, in, and again we get these delta functions which will now provide the equations for the link variables, which I will give here. So what's happening here is that we had these points A going from 1 to N in the tree amplitude. Uh, we're in four dimensions we're now, and we're, in, we're dividing those points up into a set I for positive, the points where the positive gluons, positive felicity gluons sit, and R are the points where the negative felicity gluons sit. So just as a final uh, discussion for the twister string, uh, we also managed to prove that those amplitudes uh, for all uh, values of helicity and, and negative helicities and, and positive helicities actually are equivalent to the field theory amplitudes, again by using a BCFW form shifting the kappas, or now the Cs, since the kappas have been replaced by the pi and pi bars in the Penrose spinner formulation. Um, this was really what motivate our proof here is really what motivated us to do the proof in the scattering equation case. Uh, I should say also that this proof was uh, at the functional integral level was also done by uh, David Skinner. So the final uh, discussion of the twister string is that the <coughs> twister string equations, that is these equations here. <clears throat> if you now just compute what the scattering uh, equation looks like, you can, let's let, let, remember it was Ka, Kb over Za minus Zb. If you let A be a positive felicity point, then you can rewrite it in terms of these products of the spinners, and the B is either negative or positive. If we just focus on the first term for a minute, we can rewrite the pi i's in terms of their uh, equation in terms of the link variable, and then we can substitute the link variable. Remember the link variable was lambda, lambda over z. So it's here, and if you then uh, anti-symmetrize on R and S in this calculation here, you will find that uh, you get an expression which is actually equal to the, uh, the minus the expression that you would do 
had you looked at the second term. So the sum of these two terms vanishes, showing that the twister string equations are implying the scattering equations. And one can go back. Uh, so lastly, I would like to talk about the polynomial form of the scattering equations. Uh, remember, this was the original form, just at the massless uh, case. And so we take a subset of all of the points, Ka, and we just sum over the A in that subset. We call that K sub U. We also define a variable Z sub U, which is a product of the Zs over that subset. And our observation is that these scattering equations are equivalent to the homogeneous polynomial equations K squared Z U equal to zero, where M is running from 2 to n minus 2. And the sum here is over all of that many subsets of this, uh, of this subset u, which has m elements. So you have m different equations where m is taking on these different values. Now, the way we derive that, or one way to derive that polynomial form, is to look at this function p mu of z. Now remember, z here is just a free variable, whereas before z was this set of points. So here. To, P mu depends on both the free variable and the set of points Z A. Uh, again, the momentum is conserved. The momenta are all massless. P squared is given by just squaring this object. This will have no double poles if the momentum are massless. And if you, you can rewrite this expression by uh, just pulling this double factor apart. Uh, in this form, and so that you can show that to have no sim single poles for p squared of z, you have to have this, uh, this object vanish, which is in fact just the scattering equation condition. So then if you write p squared times this factor, you can rearrange that. Remember, there are two orders of z in the denominator, so this just becomes a product with less z's in it. And that can then, it's a polynomial, so you can just start looking at the coefficients of each order of z. And it's the rest of the z sub c and the k sub s in the complement. And so using the fact that, remember, s here is 2, the, the order of s is 2, that k squared u bar is then just equal to the sum of those s's, uh, the, the sum of those k s squareds. And by momentum conservation, this uh, square of the momentum in uh, u bar will be equal to the same thing in its complement. So essentially, this piece we can replace by k squared u. And so this whole coefficient has to vanish, z u k u squared. And that is the scattering equations in the polynomial form. But you can rewrite the amplitudes. Uh, in terms of the polynomial constraints, where now, if you fix the Mobius invariance, at least uh, partially, uh, then there, uh, the z's, the z1 has gone to infinity. So to handle that, which was occurring, the z1 was occurring in H tilde, um, we can define a new HM in this way. And so this equation is what is left over when uh, uh, when, um, <coughs> when you divide out by z1. And so this is really sort of the nicest form of the scattering equations. Sorry, that was a mistake. Um, and there are n minus 3 polynomial equations here. M is running over this number. Uh, so setting hm equal to, to 0 gives you the equations. Each of the, these equations is of degree m. And so uh, and, and we're claiming that they're equivalent to the scattering equations because the scattering equations were proving that p squared equal to 0, which is how we derive this. Now, by Bayesut's theorem, that's the theorem that tells you if you have two algebraic curves that the intersection point of those curves is a product of the degree of the two curves. If you take a product of the degree of all these curves, you have n minus 3, n minus 2, dot, 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 n minus 1. You have n minus 3 solutions uh, of these m equations for uh, the ratios of these variables. And 
just to see how this starts to go. If you look at special examples of n equal 4, n equal 5, here you would have just one equation. It's a linear equation. You can solve it for the ratio. Here you have two equations. You can eliminate c4 and get a quadratic equation for this ratio. If you do n equals 6, you can eliminate, get a sextic equation, etc. So it seems to uh, help, be helping us quite a bit with the general solution of these equations. So my conclusions are that the polynomial form of the scattering equations facilitates computation of their solutions, that is zA of k, due to the linearity of the equations in the individual variable zA. So that you can see from here. That all, each zA, although they're homogeneous, the equations are homogeneous, each zA, uh, each different zA appears only once. So it's an incredibly neat form of equations. The scattering equations can be generalized to massive particles, enabling the description of tree amplitudes for massive phi cubed theory. In four dimensions, if we go to that special case, the scattering equations and the twister string equations are closely related. The proofs that we've showed uh, make it certain that both the twister string and the scattering equation approach are equivalent to gauge field theory at tree level. And we are hoping and uh, have every reason to believe that this critical reasoning may provide insight into possible extensions to loop levels of both of these non-Lagrangian methods. Thank you.